Intravenous vitamin C has a role in wound healing, collagen production in the skin and connective tissues, elimination of persistent bacteria like the one causing Lyme disease and killing cancer cells. Now I've used intravenous vitamin C in my practice for many years for preventive purposes for athletes, but also and in communication with their treating oncologist always in cancer patients to decrease disease severity and progression and often to decrease side effects from chemotherapy. Now I'm going to refer in this video to a research article that was published in Sage Journal's Integrative Cancer Therapies. It was titled Intravenous Vitamin C and Cancer as Systematic Review. And I think that this article explains the mechanism of action of vitamin C specifically on cancer cells very well and helps us understand why this treatment is extremely promising and unfortunately highly underused. In fact, Many oncologists are not aware of any studies of intravenous vitamin C for the purpose of treating cancer or improving the effectiveness of chemotherapy or for its role in decreasing the side effects of chemotherapy. Now, the authors looked at interventional and observational studies as well as randomized control trials, and they found that intravenous vitamin C may improve time to relapse and possibly enhance reductions in tumor mass and improve survival in combination with chemotherapy. Intravenous vitamin C may improve quality of life, physical function, and toxicities associated with chemotherapy. Now they further note that case reports document several instances of tumor regression and long-term disease-free survival associated with the use of intravenous vitamin C. So just to remind ourselves how long intravenous vitamin C as a therapy for cancer has been around, we have to remember that Linus Pauling won the Nobel Prize in 1962 for his work showing that intravenous vitamin C increased survival times among advanced cancer patients. He was, of course, criticized for his work and um, at some point, a study using oral vitamin C was used to dismiss his work entirely. Of course, this does not make a lot of sense because, you know, intravenous vitamin C results in significantly increased blood levels that cannot be achieved even to a fraction with oral vitamin C. Then at a later point, his intravenous protocol was repeated and found to be correct. So we can see that even in its very early history, there was pushback against using intravenous, vit uh, intravenous vitamin C in the treatment of cancer patients. And this did, did, did not center around any worries about potential side effects as they are very little to none, but possibly related to the push for pharmaceutical agents to be on the forefront. Now the authors write that the mechanism of high dose intravenous vitamin C are distinct from those of oral administered vitamin C. So she point this out clearly in the article here. Oral dosing achieves a maximum serum concentration of less than 0.25 millimole due to the limited absorptive capacity of the gastrointestinal tract. Intravenously administered vitamin C increase, can increase serum levels more than 100 fold up to 30 millimoles. So there's a huge difference, 0.25 millimole versus 30 millimole. When present at such high serum concentrations, vitamin C generates the cytotoxic reactive oxygen species, hydrogen peroxide. In normal cells, hydrogen peroxide is metabolized to water and oxygen. So this is a reaction that is initiated by the enzyme catalase. Now tumor cells lack catalase, leaving them vulnerable to the cytotoxic effects of hydrogen peroxide. So in other words, this hydrogen peroxide is not broken down in tumor cells and it builds up and then becomes damaging and destructive to the cancer cell. So the authors continue here. In addition to the inability to convert hydrogen peroxide, tumor cells selectively take up more vitamin C compared to normal cells through facilitated transport by glucose transporters. They're called GLUT. A process upregulated in tumor cells due to the increased metabolic need for glucose. Now, Cancer cells take up incredible amounts of glucose in order to produce energy as their mitochondria are dysfunctional. And I talked about this uh, in other videos before. Mitochondrial dysfunction may very well be at the very beginning of cancer because uh, the dysfunctioning mitochondria release a lot of um, oxygen, uh, radical oxygen species that are damaging to the cell and that ultimately might lead to a cell becoming, becoming a cancer cell. So the mitochondria and cancer cells can only ferment glucose and a non-essential amino acid called glutamine. Fermentation is a very primitive process of energy production where um, 
a glucose molecule can only yield about 2 ATP, so that's very low. Our normal healthy cells in the presence of oxygen undergo a much more refined process of energy production called the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle. And here, uh, one glucose molecule can yield up to 36 ATP. So fermentation yields 2 ATP. If we do it appropriately in healthy cells, you can get up to 36 ATP per sugar molecule. So significantly more than the cancer cells able to do, right? Therefore, cancer cells must take up incredible amounts of glucose to survive. And this is one reason why a part of metabolic therapy is to put patients on a ketogenic diet, which decreases carbohydrates to such low amounts that the body is forced to run on ketones, which are generated from fat. And in this environment, that is not sufficient for, there's no sufficient glucose available. So um, the other food sources that the cancer cell has, it's just glucose and glutamine essentially. And if we take away the glucose and we restrict glutamine, then the cancer cell is wiped out. And this can lead to much slower disease progression or even disease regression in many cases. Now, according to the research of Dr. Seyfried, who is really the authority on metabolic therapy, there is a second substrate, of course, that cancer cells can ferment, which I mentioned earlier, and that's glutamine, right? So metabolic therapy consists of cutting out glucose and decreasing the uptake of glutamine as we cannot easily um, regulate our dietary intake of glutamine. Plus, you know, keep in mind, that actually it's a non-essential amino acid, meaning that we produce it ourselves, right? But there's some supplements and medications that can decrease the uptake of glutamine into cells, improving the outcome of cancer patients significantly. So the authors screened 39 records and they considered higher doses, that's anything that is five gram or 5,000 milligrams of intravenous vitamin C or more, which in my opinion is still extremely low. And um, studies using only one gram or 1,000 milligrams of intravenous vitamin C were considered as low dose here. Now, this is interesting because um, we can give you um, up to 6,000 milligrams or six grams of intravenous vitamin C without doing a G6PD blood test. Now, G6PD or glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase is an enzyme that you need when we give you higher amounts of vitamin C in order to prevent a condition called methemoglobinemia or hemolytic anemia. And from the research that I have read, I conclude that a minimum of 15 grams or 15,000 milligrams of intravenous vitamin C needs to be used to have chemotherapeutic properties. So ideally, the minimum dose should be 25,000 milligrams which can be titrated up to 75,000 milligrams or even 100,000 milligrams of intravenous vitamin C if tolerated by the patient. And um, at these doses, we have much more profound effects on disease progression, actually. So addressing higher doses of vitamin C, the authors write here, four trials and one observational study showed that blood concentrations of approximately 20 to 25 millimole vitamin C can be achieved by administering the equivalent between 50 and 70 gram or 50 to 70,000 milligrams of intravenous vitamin C. Um, and then higher doses appear capable of achieving higher levels with the equivalent of about 140 grams or 140,000 milligrams vitamin C, achieving 49 millimoles and 100 grams of intravenous vitamin C um, achieving 31.9 millimole blood levels, right? However, there seems little additional benefit from higher dosages with respect to maximal blood concentrations. So they note that doses of 100 grams or 100,000 milligrams, 140 grams, 180 grams, and 220 grams, which is a huge amount, I've never used that, for a six foot, 180 pound male, showed that serum concentrations actually plateaued at 49 millimole with the 140 gram dose, which is huge again. So when you look at this one more time, so you know these are doses that I probably wouldn't use. I mean, uh, 49 is the plateau, but even if you go a little bit lower, you get very, very high uh, blood concentrations. And we don't really know, unfortunately, what the ideal blood concentration is. We know that higher levels generally work better, but the drawback at some point will be there's a, you know, when we give the IV back, there's an osmolarity issue. And also, as it shows here, there's a point at which you don't have additional benefit, right? Again, vitamin C, intravenous vitamin C is not really harmful. But again, we have to see, uh, again, there are some issues where patients become a bit lightheaded or there's some nausea that can develop during the treatment, right? 
So in terms of tumor response, they looked at two studies, one of which had patients with advanced stage four pancreatic cancer. So a very um, a severe form of cancer, very advanced disease state with unfortunately a very short life expectancy generally. And they found a decrease in tumor size in eight of nine patients completing the trial. In these patients, tumor mass decreased between 10% and 42%. There was no evidence of increased toxicity from chemotherapy with the addition of intravenous vitamin C. There was some mild transient nausea and lightheadedness during the intravenous vitamin C infusion due to osmotic load. However, other reported adverse effects were consistent with those expected from the chemotherapy regimen. And this, again, this mild nausea that's transient and lightheadedness is because when we put vitamin C into an IV bag, even if we use just sterile water instead of normal saline, the osmolarity will be very high. Now, your blood osmolarity is around 300. And when we go to high dose intravenous vitamin C, we might go to 1200, right? So there are as much more particles in there than are generally in your blood. So the osmolarity here is significantly higher. And transiently, as you give this infusion, you can have some nausea or lightheadedness, but again, that is very transient and that stops within half an hour uh, to one hour after the treatment, actually. So this is not something that will last, right? Furthermore, the authors found that intravenous vitamin C administration increased survival time and quality of life in recipients. Now, in the discussion, the authors state that the existing literature suggests that high-dose intravenous vitamin C may be a safe and effective adjunctive therapy in the treatment of cancer. There are no data suggestion that high-dose vitamin C can be used effectively as a standalone anti-cancer agent. And of course, they're very cautious here. But again, I think this is a, a good statement um, given the current literature. Um, there have, of course, been cases where people only use vitamin C with good results. But I would agree with them, you know, like we should use vitamin C as one of the regimens in the cancer treatment. It shouldn't be a standalone treatment. I think though that the effect is significantly better than what was described here, given that they looked at some of these doses that were quite low in this um, article that they published here, right? They furthermore explain that in laboratory studies, high concentrations of vitamin C have induced cytotoxicity and apoptosis, so programmed cell death, in several types of cancer. So the chemotherapeutic action of vitamin C has been tested with various cancer cells in the laboratory setting. The researchers note that some patients responded much better than others to intravenous vitamin C administration. And they state that the reason why some patients appear to respond favorably to intravenous vitamin C therapy, such as those documented in case reports, while others have not, is unclear. There may be other inter-individual um, variations in vitamin C metabolism, including factors that affect maximal intracellular vitamin C concentrations that have not yet been identified, as well as differential susceptibility to vitamin C among tumor subtypes. So that's important. So we know that some people respond better than others. There might be there may be different reasons for that. Uh, in some people, this might be taken up better. It might be the tumor type, or it might just be an individual variation from person to person here, right? So again, this article looked at the published research that is out there over a significant period of time and found positive efficacy of vitamin C used intravenously in the treatment of cancer. I think it's important to understand that it may not be regarded as a standalone treatment, but in combination with other modalities, again, can significantly improve a patient's chance for remission of their disease. And it is really a shame that many oncologists are not aware of this literature and are adamantly ref refusing, actually, to look into this. And I hear this from several patients all the time. I mean, they will allow them to do the intravenous vitamin C IV. We always check with them, right? but they dismiss this as, ah, yeah, whatever. But they don't look at the literature. And the literature clearly showed that, hey, even if you put someone on chemotherapy, you can decrease their side effects, which I think is already huge, and increase the efficacy of that drug to make that drug work better, to have better patient outcome. And still, they're dismissing it. Again, because it's, it's not a pharmaceutical. That's the only reason I can come up here, right? Anyway, so they're not aware of the literature and, you know, Again, it might be that the pharma industry is talking here really after all, right? From all the data that we have currently, it is fairly clear that vitamin C, intravenous vitamin C, can enhance the efficacy of chemotherapy drugs and decrease their side effects. That's very clear and documented and, you know, it's, it's literature that's available. This is something that all oncologists should welcome and strive for in their treatment of their patients. 
High-dose intravenous vitamin C can also be combined with metabolic therapy, and I think it should be. I did a video about this that you can uh, see here. You can click on this and watch that. Metabolic therapy, again, is hugely important as well, and it can easily be combined with intravenous vitamin C to have even better outcome, right? And of course, traditional treatments such as chemotherapy can, of course, also be included. And I think sometimes they may be included at lower doses to decrease side effects, because when you have two other treatments that are working already on decreasing cancer cells, on decreasing tumor size, on decreasing the risk of the tumor spreading, then you may be getting away with a lower dose of chemotherapy. But this would, of course, require that the oncologist understand all the treatments that you do and simultaneously and monitor the patient accordingly, right? So again, if you or loved one are affected by cancer, a discussion with your treating oncologist should include, in my opinion, the topic of addressing you know, intravenous vitamin C, metabolic therapy, and other modalities that can be done simultaneously. I think we're doing a great disservice to people not to explore all the other modalities in which we can help. And metabolic therapy essentially is something that a patient can do on their own. It should always be discussed with the treating physician oncologist because you have cases where someone is very cachectic or very uh, weak and has lost a lot of weight. And then sometimes we can't do certain dietary changes. Absolutely. There are cases when people cannot take intravenous vitamin C if, for example, their G6PD levels are too low. So there's always things to consider if their kidney function is not good. There are always some drawbacks of, of any treatment that need to be discussed. That's why I'm always saying get your treating physician on board. But again, having a multitude of um, therapies working simultaneously will always yield a better outcome. If this was helpful or if you have... Um, experienced high-dose vitamin C might be prophylactically or for disease uh, uh, pre prevention or disease treatment, please leave a comment. Please subscribe. I would like to hear um, your uh, comments on this. Also, if you have any questions on this, I think this is a, a very important topic. Please leave um, some comments or questions there and I will look at all those. A lot of times they also give me ideas for future videos.